right, good morning and thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Steve, uh, for kicking us off. So I'm delighted to moderate the first panel uh, discussion and presentation. So let me just give you the overview of today. So this panel is about understanding the requirements and the opportunities. The next panel will talk about the international perspective and the final panel in the afternoon will talk about the technological options. So for this first panel, I'm really delighted to welcome our colleagues uh, from industry and also from academia. First, we'll hear from Clyde Lutan from the California Independent System Operator. And Clyde is going to overview the current status uh, from the perspective of CalISO and also the requirements looking at some of the recent data coming in. Next, we'll hear from Erin Minier from EPRI, and she will speak on a very important aspect, which is when and how much energy storage do we need? And then finally, uh, Adrian, who uh, is from our department uh, here at Stanford, he is a returnee, if that's a word, uh, from industry. Uh, for the past 10 years, he was the founder and CTO of Empower, uh, a battery um, cell startup here in the United States. And he's going to speak about how fast we're able to learn these new technologies and how can we speed them up. So without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Clyde to come to the stage and then share the CalISO perspective. Clyde. Well, good morning, and thank you, well, for inviting the California ISO to participate. <clears throat> um, so before we get started, I'd like to talk a little about the California ISO, what it is we do. So we maintain reliability by delivering uh, energy across most of California and a small portion of Nevada. Uh, we also look at the transmission planning uh, process, look out, you know, a few years, sometimes up to 10 to 20 years, and figure out what it is we need on the grid and ensure that we have enough uh, transmission capacity, genera generating capacity uh, to meet that demand. Um, we also drive innovation as we have more and more renewables coming out to the grid. Uh, one of my responsibilities is looking at how well we conform or comply with the NERC real-time uh, control performance standards. So I get a look at the system on a minute-by-minute -minute basis to make sure that uh, as we integrate more and more renewables, we can comply with those standards and also determine what it is we need to uh, operate a reliable grid. Um, for some of you that's familiar with the Western um, US, we also operate on uh, energy imbalance market, which is every five minutes, we ensure that the energy we uh, serve through the market, through 22 participating um, or participants currently, they get the cheapest energy every five minutes uh, to meet the demand. Um, and then we also have um, serve as reliability coordinator in the West, which really is like um, uh, your air traffic controller that looks at you know, individual planes. So we look at the individual BAs in most of the West to ensure, because uh, we can see, you know, everything that goes on and direct individual balancing authorities what it is they uh, need to do. A quick, I'm just going to hit on a, a couple of these points. Uh, California ISO peaked at 50,061 megawatts last September, September 6th. Uh, that was quite a day. And we operate a market that's about 739 billion uh, dollars um, based on 2022 um, information. Uh, we serve about 32 million um, uh, people in California and a small part of uh, Nevada. And we operate one of nine uh, ISOs, RTOs in the US and North America, um, uh, Canada. With that, a lot about the EIM. EIM, you know, is helping a lot with renewables. So we tend to uh, utilize EIM a lot to uh, mitigate uh, curtailments that we see on the system. So currently, as I said, we got 22 participants. 
And since the EIM started in 2014, uh, we already saved uh, EIM participants roughly $3 billion uh, and uh, reduced uh, CO2 emission by 800,000 uh, metric tons. Uh, real quick here, as we integrate more and more renewables in the system, what it is we're seeing currently? Well, we tend to see a lot of oversupply during the middle of the day, especially on weekends. And we're looking for ways now, and this is, you know, hopefully some of you guys can have uh, ideas how we could avoid curtailments or minimize curtailments. Um, we're looking at new technologies, you know, consumer programs, and storage is right at the top of that list. Storage batteries, the ISO is neutral, so we're agnostic to any type of uh, technology to uh, store energy. Demand response, what that is, is how can we move sh shape and shift load uh, to meet the current variable energy uh, supply that we see on the system. Time of use rate, we had recommended time of use rate where when we have an abundance of energy, we, we, we propose the cheapest energy rate where you could incentivize you know, customers to um, do whatever it is they need to do um, to help the grid. And that last bullet, the electric vehicles, um, we're looking at ways now, how can we use electric vehicles to regulate the grid? Because um, if you think about it, electric vehicles, even though it's on the distribution, it impacts system frequency. And if we can figure out ways to utilize electric vehicles, I think it's gonna go a long way helping to control or regulate frequency on the grid. Uh, by that, you know, what I like to tell folks is, if you buy an electric vehicle, and you're gonna go, let's say you, you need to use 60% off your charge tomorrow, you can just, an app, you can say, I you wanna participate in regulation surface. Everything above 60% uh, charge, we can use that to regulate the, the grid up and down to maintain uh, frequency in the system. It's a simple concept. I, I think it's easily implementable, and it's something we need to start thinking of how, you know, millions of electric vehicles sitting out there. It's gonna be very difficult to, to control these through a centralized control system, but I think through um, uh, frequency control, we can make that work. Now, this is a plot really starting off. Back in 2018, we were looking at well, what it is we need. Now, uh, everything that's shown here is actual generation of production that we saw on the grid for March, April, May in 2018. The blue is the actual um, demand of the system. The red dotted curve is the net, which is your, your demand minus uh, wind minus solar. And you can see the abundance of solar we see on the system during the middle of the day. And that dotted line that you see is actually the five minute energy prices. And uh, you can see a shape there, right? The five minute energy prices is pretty high uh, just before sunrise and then during uh, sunset. So we had uh, predicted that um, this is a good area here, right before sunrise. It's, it's a good area to discharge batteries and just after sunset to discharge again. And during the middle of the day, you charge a lot because that's when we tend to see oversupply on the grid. Now, the area between the solar and that blue is where you know, you'd have things like hydro, you'd have uh, natural gas plants, you'd have imports filling in uh, that gap. But this is one opportunity that you can see where um, batteries could come in or any kind of storage where you can help out during the morning and the evening. Now, the reason why this is important is just before sunrise, if you look at 4 a.m., 4 a.m. is when we tend to see minimum loads on the system. So you, the operators would tend to shut everything they don't need, to shut that down. And in the old days, you had that blue curve where, you know, from 4 a.m., you committed resources to meet your peak demand for the end of the day. Well, now, you cannot really do that because as soon as you start committing units, you have the solars coming up. And you're gonna have to shut those units that you committed down. Well, that's a challenge because a lot of um, uh, co combined cycle plants, they may have one stop start for the day. And if you need that unit for the evening, you may not be able to get it. So it's really an, uh, an interesting balancing game you're gonna play here, how storage can, can, can come in. And you can see during the middle of the day, 
that's an area there where you can charge quite a bit. Now, this is actual generation for um, uh, May 25th, uh, sorry, March 25th. And on this day, if you look at the red, this is actual curtailment. That's enough uh, curtailment for roughly uh, eight, 80 to 100,000 uh, homes, right? So that, that red area right there is oversupply. And what is this really telling us, right? The challenges, you can see right off the bat the need for uh, storage on the system. We're trying to minimize this, this red area here. Um, my concern is the imports that's coming in. When it's hot in the rest of the West, it's really hard to get that import. And you can see how we shape the imports today. During the morning, uh, you can shape that. And the previous slide I showed you is where storage comes in handy uh, during just before sunrise and then just after sunset. So we starting to see that play out. Natural gas and hydro. Um, again, this is on March 25th. And I'm really excited to see what's going to happen towards the end of this month with the, a lot of, uh, the amount of hydro that we got um, and the, the snow melt. This, this plot is going to look uh, pretty interesting. So again, this plot shows you uh, the amount of curtailments that we see and how do you really manage that? Well, if you look back uh, about three weeks ago, uh, April 23rd, um, this net load, which is the, the um, red dotted curve, is really encroaching onto your not, not as possible generation, right? So the very bottom there is the two nuclear plants we got in California. Just above that, you got things like geothermal, biomass, biogas, and you can see how flat that is. So it's really non-dispatchable. Now, when, when you have a lot of wind and a lot of solar, and you have operating conditions like this, during the middle of the day, you tend to have no downward dispatchability. So when, when let's say solar kicks up or wind kicks up, you have nothing to back off. So some of the problems we face is things like high frequency, high area control error, you try to export as much as you could, and you try to minimize curtailment. So this is what we starting to see. What this also tells you is we need um, essential grid services from inverter-based resources, wind, solar, and storage. Uh, we need, and when I say essential grid services, we need things like voltage control, uh, frequency control, and the ability to ramp up and ramp down. So in other words, if the system operator needs help and instruct a battery or um, an inverter-based resource to move up or move down, we like to see that unit move at a control um, uh, trajectory. So the renewables, they're pretty quick today, but being quick is not good in some instances because we got to control, control frequency. When we control frequency, what we really do is we get benchmark every minute as to how well we support the interconnection frequency. So having enough, uh, too much generation is a bad thing. Having too little generation is a bad thing. So you got to try to balance that as best as you could and you need things to fill the gap, right? Uh, so um, on this day, we exported quite a bit. Again, we could tell uh, quite a bit, and the takeaway from this slide is dispatchability during the middle of the day. How do you control system frequency? And at the end of each month, we got to report to the North American Electric Reliability Council how well we supported the interconnection frequency. And it's not a good thing uh, to to uh, have a score less than 100%. So you try to maintain that. Do everything that you could um, to maintain that. Um, uh, system frequency. Uh, this is looking at uh, system peak on September 6th last year was the highest demand we saw in the system, which was uh, 52,061 megawatts. This is an interesting plot. When you look at it, California imports a lot of energy. So that very uh, green at the top, it tells you uh, we rely a lot on imports. Well, what happens now is when we have consecutive hot days in the West, where do you get that imports? Everybody need that energy for themselves, right? So prices go high, it's really hard to get that import. And you can see we have a lot of solar. But what again this chart tells you is, when it's hot, you get very, very little wind. So when we, we in like the previous plot, when um, we had a lot of wind, on days when it's really hot and you need that su support from uh, renewables, uh, you don't get it. 
So again, this plot shows you uh, the need for storage. It shows you the need for storage greater than four hours. So during the, the, the evening ramp, what we had to do in some cases is quickly charge batteries so that we'd have the batteries available when the solar drops off uh, or drops at night. And again, you know, you hear a lot of folks saying, well, uh, there were days when California ISO served, um, uh, well, last uh, Mother's Day, we served 100% uh, of the energy needs for 63 consecutive minutes from renewables, which is, you know, a huge task. So um, f some folks will say, well, you don't really need natural gas anymore. But on hot days like this, yes, you do need uh, natural gas. You do rely on imports. So we've got to figure out, you know, storage plays a huge part in how we operate the grid. Now, we've seen this in the West. Folks in the rest of the country, they still do not have a lot of renewables. So they tend to, um, we see things when I attend meetings, and you know, I, I say, well, these are the challenges we see out West. Uh, a lot of folks, you know, well, you know, they say, well, we don't see that yet. Um, so again, uh, th this is a pretty um, interesting plot. If you look at the hydro, uh, during uh, September timeframe, actually from late June, July, August, you don't have a lot of hydro on the system. Uh, places like, you know, Pacific Gas and Electric, they utilize that hydro pretty judiciously so they can save that energy to meet the peak demand when the price of energy is high. But for things like ramp and flexibility, uh, you don't have a lot of flexibility. Now, um, looking in terms of long-term storage, uh, again, I like this plot that it shows you that this, again, this is actual data. When you look at, um, in 2019, we saw a, a whole week where we had very, very little wind and solar. So um, the challenge here is how much long-term storage do you, you, you need. So there are studies ongoing right now with the California Energy Commission trying to figure out, well, uh, do you need something longer than four hours, something longer than eight hours, or can you stack four-hour storage or eight-hour storage to meet the demand? Um, we do not have a lot of pump storage in uh, California. We, uh, in, in, within the ISO footprint, I think we got a little over 2,000 megawatts, but that's not enough to show you uh, the kind of curtailments that we see. Now, again, here you can see we rely a lot on the gas uh, to provide things like ancillary services. But when you have over 20,000 megawatts of wind and solar, and uh, your production is less than 4,000 megawatts, you can see that's a challenge. You can see the need for um, storage on the system. You look to the right, the right shows you a week where we had in May, you had a lot of wind, a lot of solar, uh, the, you still had a lot of hydro, and that's what we're gonna see at, towards the end of this month. And you back off your, your gas fleet, you know, quite a bit. Now, this also poses problems for system operators. And uh, when, I, when I say it poses problems, when you back your gas fleet all the way down, you, you gotta um, comply with things like uh, frequency response capability. What, what that means is if you lose a big unit, and, and the new standard from FERC now is if you lose anything in an end of connection, you got 52 seconds to help um, recover, right? or arrest frequency and recover. So having that capability when you back your resources way down, um, it, sometimes it's not there. Uh, if you look at the hydro, the hydro, it's, it's a lot of hydro. When you have a lot of hydro, you get very little ancillary services from hydro. They're either spilling, which is they operate in pretty close to the, the max, and you get no uh, ancillary service up, and they wouldn't deck. So this is where storage comes in um, handy. So this is another area where storage can come in not only to meet or, or to generate when the price is high and, and, and charge when the price is low, but ancillary services. You, you know, we're looking at ways where storage could participate in things like regulation, uh, frequency control, um, and it's something you need to operate a reliable grid. So um, on this slide again, uh, by 2025, the two nuclear plants we have in California, which is at the bottom, that's gonna go. But you can see, again, how we operate geothermal, biomass, biogas. You get no flexibility out of those units. And you gotta rely, again, on storage. You gotta rely on your existing gas fleet and your hydro. 
and utilize the, the imports as best as you can. As I said, one of the biggest challenges we have is getting out imports on hot days when uh, the rest of the West is hot. And most of you are familiar with uh, the duck curve. And moving forward, how are we going to ensure um, you know, a reliable future? And we're doing everything currently. We're getting a lot of help by trying to make that duck you know, flat. So you know, I talked about things like uh, demand response. Uh, how can you um, uh, shape and shift load to f flatten that out? Uh, because this rump right here on evenings, uh, we anticipate that this year, not this year, but yeah, by, by next year, to hit 20,000 megawatts. And ramping up 20,000 megawatts on a gas fleet is not really uh, practical to say. So we rely a lot on imports. So that's one area here where batteries can help. They can ramp pretty fast. And um, so we talked about time of use rates. That's going to help here. Uh, electric vehicles. So everything that I mentioned before and whatever you guys can think of that can help us you know, move from a sitting dock to a flying dock is, is, is welcome. You can talk to me after this um, meeting um, of open airs. And, uh, we want to make this work, and um, I'm optimistic that by 2030 we can serve 60% of the demand from renewables, and, and, and I'm pretty optimistic that we can um, collectively um, operate 100% carbon-free grid, you know, by 2045. Um, All right, thank you very much, Clyde. So please hold your questions. We'll do a Q&A at the end. Uh, following the two additional talks. So next, uh, let me invite Aaron Minier from EPRI to share with us on when, how much storage do we need, and how much can we pay for it. So Aaron, please. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Aaron Mayer with EPRI. I manage the Energy Storage and Distributed Generation Program at EPRI. Um, we we do a lot in, of research on energy storage from analysis and you know, planning and economics to technology evaluation and um, implementation, how to, how to get these systems deployed in the field. So I'll talk a little bit about one of the analysis projects that we did. And uh, just to let you know up front, I don't have the answers. We, we are evaluating it. It's a continuous uh, journey that we need to go on to keep reassessing the situation as we get new information. So some of the questions to talk about. What is long duration energy storage? Why do we need it? When and how much? And then what are the performance and cost requirements? So again, it depends. It depends on who you ask. It depends on the assumptions of your scenarios. Um, and, and it depends on how quickly the market evolves. Um, so what is long duration storage? So Stephen defined it as three days. Um, you know, I think we saw in California some of the um, community aggregators put out a, a procurement a few years ago, and they were looking for eight-hour storage. Um, DOE uh, put out their uh, funding opportunity for long duration storage last year, and they defined it as more than 10 hours. So I think it's a moving target, and um, there's lots of different flavors of long duration storage that fill different needs. Why do we need it? I think this one is a little more clear. We, we all know decarbonization, high renewable penetration will require storage. Um, there's also resilience, you know, natural disasters. Again, here in California, we have wildfires with public safety power shutoffs. So there will be needs for long duration storage for both decarbonization and resilience. So how is storage used now? I won't go into this too much because we just heard from Clyde and I you know, took one of the, the KISO graphs as well. Um, and right now we're seeing a lot of four hour storage. Four hour storage largely because um, many of the ISO and RTO markets um, for resource adequacy capacity have a four hour duration. But that's not true for all of them. In some regions they may have a six or eight hour requirement to receive full credit for uh, capacity. And so, again, there's regional differences, and then um, just how, how um, the grid is evolving, how renewable penetration, how storage is evolving. And so that four hours, as the cost comes down and it becomes more economic, we'll see longer duration 
technologies being deployed. And so, you know, as we start to, to flatten the, or shave off the top of that peak, the peak just gets wider. So um, we will need longer duration storage to cover that peak. And then thinking about, you know, we talked about multi-day, you know, the sun's not shining, the wind's not blowing. How do we keep a reliable power system um, during those periods of renewable droughts. And so there's an opportunity for you know, weekly storage that can cover multiple days. And then taking one step further, talking about balancing severe and, and very high renewable penetration scenarios when you have a significant amount of storage, we don't want to, or solar, we don't want to curtail all that. We want to store it, shift it. And so when you get into these um, scenarios of overgeneration seasonally, that's the opportunity for seasonal storage. All right, so now I'll take a little bit more time to, to talk about a study that we did at EPRI that looked at, you know, when do we need um, storage, how much. Um, we use this, uh, EPRI has a tool called Regen, which looks at the eco system-wide economy and takes in a lot of different factors about you know, policy, load growth, generation mix, and determines, you know, what, what the optimal mix is to serve the needs of the, the grid. And so the, the question of when and how much really depends on the scenario. So this is one example of different policy scenarios and how that impacts um, what storage would get selected in an, an optimal um, system-wide perspective. And so um, the, this reference case was for 2035 or all the cases were for 2035, but the reference case is assuming today's policy is, um, is enacted. So you've got a lot of targets in, in certain areas, you've got um, you know, storage targets, renewable targets, decarbonization targets. So the reference scenario is what exists today. The net zero is um, that plus um, carbon renewal, re removal. So different technologies or carbon removal strategies. And you can see that um, you start to need larger, uh, du longer durations of energy storage when you go from the reference case to a net zero case. So taking it a step further, looking at carbon free. So carbon free would be, does not include car uh, carbon removal as an option, but does include nuclear as an option. And so again, you see as we get increasingly stringent on the decarbonization policies, um, then you will see longer duration storage needed. And so, you know, in this scenario, you start to see the daily storage, the daily shifting of storage, um, and then start to get into that weekly, and then even some, you know, longer duration, um, 100 hour, I think in, in this case, it says over 100, but in, in some of the cases, you know, up to 500 hours of storage um, for this carbon free scenario. And then if you go to the 100% renewable scenario, you uh, again see an increasing mix of the different technologies that are needed and selected um, for this scenario. So again, the, not a, we have an answer for a very specific question, um, but this question, ha the, uh, there's a lot of assumptions that went into this, and so when you change those assumptions, you get different mixes. So it helps to inform us um, because I think we, that's what we need. We need information to inform how we make policy, how we um, deploy storage, how we look at technology and um, develop technology and the different attributes they need. Um, so, you know, building on um, some of the results from that study, how does that inform performance and cost requirements? Um, so, uh, highlighting a, a few of the key findings from that, um, the first one, so cost assumptions can lead to different uh, technology choices. So um, we had several different technologies in there with um, estimated costs. We had you know, um, a base scenario, an optimistic, a pes pessimistic, because we're really not certain how the industry is going to evolve and what the cost might look like. So we wanted to run many different scenarios to understand this. We also um, came up with this, what we call hypothetical battery, because we don't know what we, we can't pin it down to a particular technology at this point. So if there is a, a flow battery or some other battery out there that is um, you know, lo lower cost um, on the, the energy portion, you know, what does that look like? It's much lower cost than, say, lithium ion um, and you know, lower power costs than we might see um, with some of the alternative, maybe thermal 
um, or a pump storage systems. So we had this um, hypothetical battery and, and when you include that in the mix, so you can see the different scenarios um, of no hypothetical and then including it in the scenario, how that changes the mix of um, which technologies uh, may get selected in that scenario. The second finding was that round trip efficiency of the technology also matters. So that hypothetical battery, what, what is the efficiency of it and how does that change how it gets selected? So two scenarios run is if it's 75 percent round trip efficiency or if it's 50 percent round trip efficiency. And um, so you see again on the, the bars there's a low efficiency and a high efficiency. And again there's a change in how the technologies are selected and obviously it gets um, selected more in a higher efficiency scenario. Um, next finding, um, very low energy capacity costs. Um, it re we still need uh, very long duration storage um, with, with low energy costs to handle the curtailment and the, um, or to mitigate the curtailment. Again, because we don't want, if we install all these renewables, if we're curtailing them, we're just going to have to significantly overbuild to account. Um, if we can't shift it, we're going to have to significantly overbuild. So it's finding that balance of um, storing the, um, the energy and shifting it versus overbuild. And so, um, we will need very low cost energy. So that's where we see hydrogen coming into play. And then um, technology availability has um, system-wide implications. So if you, you know, remove a technology from the scenario, how does that impact it? Again, if we have this hypothetical battery, uh, if we don't have it, um, again, it, it can change the mix. And so I think the overall takeaway from this study is that it's just too early to pick winners. We're going to need a variety of technologies that can help. Um, and, and the more technologies we have and with different technology attributes, it will enable that optimized system so we can select um, the technologies that meet the needs and as, and as the needs evolve over time. So this is a particular point in time, you know, looking at that, this reference scenario. Um, if we look out even further, the needs will change again. So I think the study can um, helps us to inform some of these um, decisions that we're making and how we um, approach long duration storage. Um, but it's not the end answer. It's you know a continuous analysis that uh, we will, will refine over time. And so we're looking at this. Um, this study was from 2021. We're redoing it again this year, looking at regional aspects. So how does that? This was a, a U.S. wide model. How did Particular regions, if you if you look at those regions, how do um, those compare um, based on their uh, policy and generation mix and their load requirements? And then also looking at different weather years. And so, it, you know, you the assumptions on weather and how weather might evolve. We have um, an effort at at every called climate ready that's trying to understand the you know how we can. Um, account and prepare for the different um, climate scenarios going forward. So looking at other weather scenarios will also change the results. Um, so again, the start of a conversation, um, and I think it helps to lead into some of the discussion later today on you know, regional focuses and technology. Um, we need to look at it all in order to, to be ready. So I will uh, pass it on and take questions later. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Aaron, and then Last but not least, let me invite Adrian to come to the podium, and he will share his insights on technology learning curves. Great. Thank you. All right. Just a clicker. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Adrian Yao, and uh, I'm an industry returned graduate researcher, but I like Will's term, returnee, a little bit better. <laughs> Um, for the past nine years, I was the co-founder and CTO of a lithium-ion battery company called NPower, and we actually recently just acquired a gigafactory in Indianapolis, Indiana. But I decided to step out from my own company last year so that I can return to academia and pivot my focus towards the problem of long-duration energy storage um, and really take advantage of the risk-taking potential and tolerance only afforded by an institution like Stanford uh, before going back out to industry again. So very happy to be with all of you today. Um, today I'm not going to be talking about new ways of building batteries. Um, in light of this theme, today I'm going to be talking instead about new ways of thinking about what to build. 
um, and really thinking with the end in mind. And this is kind of following on Aaron's point, it's too early to kind of choose winners, but how do we make sure that what we work on has the best chance of winning? Um, and given the short time frames we have to act, we really can't afford to wait too long uh, and not think holistically from the very outset. So I wanna propose a systems level techno-economic framework for, building, uh, for guiding what it is we should be building. Um, now I know that sounds like just a long string of really big words that could literally mean anything. So let me start off with an example so that we can all build an intuitive feel for what I mean by this. Now since this is a long duration energy storage workshop, um, and uh, Dr. Stephen Chu earlier brought up the flow battery. Let's, let's use this as, as an example. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with what this is, this is basically a battery cell where you take the energy components out of the cell and basically treat the cell more as a reactor. So you can think of this as a chemical plant that can reversibly charge and discharge chemical fuels stored externally. And the concept here is that we can begin to separate the storage component from the reaction component uh, and thereby decouple the energy and power components. And since these tanks can now be independently scaled, if we can make them as big as we want, if we want longer duration storage, we can make the tanks bigger. Um, then if we look at the cost curve, then uh, whereas conventional batteries like lithium ion batteries have a fixed cost with respect to duration, uh, flow batteries can potentially and theoretically approach this electrolyte cost floor. Um, that's really uh, asymptotic and dictated by the uh, fundamental materials cost of the electrolyte. Right? And so therefore, as material scientists and uh, chemical engineers, we should therefore focus on developing low-cost electrolytes, and we should be well on our way to solving some of these problems. Right? So just a quick show of hands, how many people are familiar with this kind of concept? Great. Well, this is wrong. <laughs> and reality is actually much more complex. And if we look at our cartoon here, where we went wrong is actually up here. And this is part of the problem with simplified diagrams because the realities of connecting a battery cell to the grid requires a technology stack that looks like this. And we need to be able to bring the voltages of DC side up to several hundred to several thousand volts before we can inject it into an inverter and then convert it to AC. Now you might think, well, if we just take our flow battery with you know, maybe a single cell voltage of one or two volts, depending on chemistry, why can't we just stack it in electrically in series and get our operating current uh, and be well on our way? Well, the answer is you can. But the problem is that while this is electrically in series, it's also hydraulically in parallel, which means that you're going to get the shunt current loss that uh, eats away at your efficiency. And the more you stack cells in, volt in series, the more loss you build up. So if you actually want to connect this kind of technology to the grid, these, you start to see that the system topologies get really complex, oftentimes requiring more than just one pair of tanks. And so if you look at any commercial demonstration of redox flow batteries, you always see many more than just one pair of tanks, right? If it were true, then we should ideally have just two big tanks and an arbitrary number of reactors, but that's not what we see, because they actually do need to be electrically isolated. Now, don't just take my word for it. Look at every single commercial demonstration of redox flow batteries, and you always see way more than just two tanks. So, did we really decouple energy and power at the systems level? Or did we just increase the size of our unit cell, which is now a 40-foot container. And that's not necessarily saying it's wrong, but we also have to ask the question, how quickly can costs fall uh, due to learning rates? And here's a general uh, observation from our group that says that typically the bigger things are, the slower you learn. Now this is, again, just an example. My point here isn't to say uh, we should stop working on redox flow batteries. That's not my message here. It really is that if this is news to you, this illustrates the dangers of not doing systems analysis from the very outset, uh, and, and we can't afford to run into these roadblocks when we're four, six, ten years in, right? So I hope that illustrates what I mean by this long string of big words, um, and we can dive, dive in. Um, so when we talk about long duration energy storage, like Aaron and Clyde talked about, um, it off, the questions often revolve around the amount, the duration, and the cost, right? Now, as we begin to build a sense of what these requirements should be, and, and like Aaron said, we're not gonna answer those questions today because it really depends on what we're looking at. Um, it's important as, as engineers to not dive and jump straight into our favorite chemistries or whatever we think gut feeling wise is gonna be lowest cost. Uh, instead, we really have to take a step back and ask the question, what system architectures make the most sense? And I'd like to offer two components to help answer this question. And that is a holistic technical scope 
which is an example we just kind of walk through, uh, but also a, uh, what I call a learning techno-economic framework. So let me dive deeper. A holistic technical scope just means a multi-level systems architecture analysis, where we start to ask questions starting from the macroscopic site level, such as when does energy density actually matter? Uh, and then zooming into the container level and asking questions like, you know, how many cells per container maximizes learning rates while also minimizing costs? And then zooming in again to the cell level and asking questions like, are drop-in technologies or drop-in replacements to existing technologies most cost competitive? Right, so this really represents technical breadth. This is number one. Number two is the learning techno-economic framework. And this is really understanding how technologies actually scale. So every technology has what we call a techno technology curve. And you can pl plot basically the price or the cost of the technology as a function of scale, such as cumulative gigawatt hours installed, uh, and also with respect to time, right? And it's in my opinion that it's up to institutions like Stanford to instantiate new curves, put them on the map, and then hand them off to industry to traverse the scaling portion, which is arguably the much harder part. But when we at Stanford are thinking about instantiating new curves, we have to keep four key things in mind because those are the things that we can more or less control. Right, the first is the minerals cost floor, uh, and that's dictated by the elemental, the mineral, and the, and the material composition of not just a cell, but the entire technology stack. The second is the manufacturing complexity or system complexity, because that dictates your initial cost. The third is a learning rate. Um, this is not something so much you can control. You can't say, I want to learn at 24% per year, year on year. Um, it's more so that uh, decisions in our design process can affect uh, some of these things. And lastly, we have to recognize that the way to pull us down the curve with speed is dictated by the market growth rate. Uh, and, and maybe having the ability to service multiple markets can help accelerate the adoption and cost reductions of certain technologies. Now, the most important part, though, is that we need to recognize that there, number one, is an incumbent curve and where that incumbent curve sits. And given the circumstances of climate change and the short time frames we have to act, we also have a very short period to make sure that our new technology curves have the opportunity to intersect and overtake the incumbent curve. And if this condition is not satisfied based on our initial analysis, we really have to stop and think uh, whether we should continue uh, working on what we're doing. Now, this all, this all sounds well and good, um, but let's actually put this to practice um, and start off with an example. Let's start small. Small in terms of technical scope and that this is just a cell level comparison, but big in terms of the implications of this kind of question. Now, this is a short duration storage kind of example. I know we're talking about long duration here, but this is a really good example of how to implement this kind of framework. So basically, we're trying to ask this question. Are we looking at the, the condition on the left or a condition on the right, right? Now, I think I don't need to belabor the sodium ion opportunity. I think many of you here are familiar with this. It really boils down to the materials availability and therefore potential for lower cost of sodium, and also the drop in compatibility, uh, drop in compatibility of uh, sodium ion into existing gigafactories for lithium ion, uh, and also the ability to potentially benefit from what is an already learned process, right? And so if you look at a sodium ion battery, it looks and feels just like a lithium ion battery. And given the roller coaster ride we just went through with lithium carbonate in the last two years, we're starting to be inundated with a lot of buzz and a lot of hype about whether sodium ion uh, batteries will disrupt and conquer. Um, and we're also starting to see some very aggressive cost targets. So let's actually put this to the test with the techno-economic model I just mentioned. And we can start to pull in together these four pieces of information. Now to do this properly and to make sure that what we're trying to do is industrially relevant, we've managed to convince the industry leading consultancies to hand over literally hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of proprietary data to us so that we can run this uh, analysis and really collaborate on answering this very important question. So on the cost floor side, we have commodity price forecasts out to 2040 and 2050 by the likes of Benchmark Minerals and Wood McKenzie. To establish the and predict the initial cost of batteries, uh, we built our own manufacturing cost model, um, derived in large part from my personal experience building and running a gigafactory, but also with a panel of industry consultants and also getting quotes directly from material suppliers. To understand learning rates, we can run regressions on data from Avicen and Bloomberg BNEF, and we have a wealth of market growth data. Right? So if we come back to our two curves that we now know and love, um, just a little bit more scientifically, 
We can import the data on prices, on demand, and have our model ingest all of this data, and we can see that it spits out a curve establishing the baseline for lithium ion, specifically LFP lithium ion, with pretty remarkable fit. And you can see that it's even able to capture the first time lithium ion cell prices increased last year because of the underlying lithium carbonate volatility. Right? So now that we've established a good baseline, we can then begin to lay on what we think sodium ion will be. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all the assumptions, but really the point here is that we're taking a very generous assumption base case for sodium ion, uh, while also being really, really realistic with the inputs. So we're getting quotes from directly from the current manufacturing base, which is largely based in China, with realistic quotes on what things would cost today, right, if we were to make this at scale. And so naturally, with any new technology, the curve, the, the initial starting cost is going to be higher. But the key question is then, how quickly will costs fall, right? And this is where we have the first word of warning, right? If we just willy-nilly throw on some conventional learning rate like we often do and expect us to learn the same rate as lithium ion, we're going to paint this overly optimistic picture that says that we're going to hit cost parity within one year of debut, uh, and that's, that's kind of a little bit too rosy. And that's because conventional learning rates will approach zero dollars per kilowatt hour, which is obviously unphysical, right? So we have to implement some kind of minerals cost floor constraint. We also need to recognize that different parts of a battery will learn at different rates, right? So how do we know what those should be? Well, if we look at the bill of materials cost breakdown over the last 10 years of lithium ion, we can actually see, yes, in fact, various parts of the battery learn at very different rates. And if we look at, and for example, like, yeah, so manufacturing is much faster than, for example, the rate of learning in active material powders like cathode and anodes. So if we look at where we think sodium ion is going to be in 2024, assuming that's the first year in which we start to manufacture this at tens of gigawatt hours, we can see that the drop in compat com compatibility allows us to benefit from a very low overhead in the beginning, but also means that our learnings there are saturated. And that really to approach the minerals cost floor of sodium ion, which is lower as expected than LFP, but not by much, we really need to rely on the cost reductions coming from the materials production. And as you can see, it, it, it happens much slower. So if we, turk, if we take an example scenario where sodium ion dominated all non-lithium stationary storage, ESS, so that lithium ion is growing alongside sodium ion, um, we can plot the demand curve in those purple dots on the bottom. And you can see that still the stationary energy storage market, as it is today, is still much lower than the demand driven by electrification of vehicles for lithium ion. And you'll start to see the importance of the market growth rate here. We can see that um, and if we basically uh, assume a range of learning rates based on our uh, sensitivity analysis from the prior slides, we can see that sodium ion struggles to keep up. And in this scenario, we're likely not going to have cost parity. What if we take the even more generous assumption that sodium ion dominated all stationary storage, period, uh, including the market share attributed to uh, lithium ion? So you can see the curve of the demand curve has increased, and you can see that that improves the scenario, but still, sodium ion here still struggles. And if anything, it might be a slightly lower performance, slightly more expensive cousin to lithium ion within this period. Now, this all sounds a little bit uh, kind of out of control, but um, if we then ask the question, you know, what about the lithium minerals cost, right? Because that is definitely a concern. That would be a good question to ask, because it, based on our model, we actually do see a significant supply shortfall for lithium carbonate. And if we feed this back into our model, we can see that we can, the, the lithium ion price begins to stay high. And comparing this back against our sodium ion baseline, we start to see that the competitiveness of sodium ion does actually rely on the lithium minerals prices staying high, which actually is a sentiment shared with us by the key sodium ion players in the industry that are part of our Consult, uh, industry panel of consultants. Now this, uh, you might think, you know, this is out of our control, what, what can we do? Well, there are a couple of things that we can do as both researchers and also policymakers. So there are two components to dollars per kilowatt hour, right? There is the dollars per kg portion, which is the materials cost, and so far we've only been talking about this portion. And we can reduce that just by manufacturing scale, and that's called something called uh, learning by doing. But there's also this kg per kilowatt hour component as well, which is the materials intensity. 
And we can improve upon this by improving the energy density of materials and therefore require less materials. And this is basically learning by researching. So if we look at the historic trends of uh, lithium ion, we can see that materials have increased steadily over the past 30-ish years. And if we assume not the same, but more aggressive learning rates in terms of learning by researching for sodium ion, we can see that we, can, we, we start to pull that curve in. Now, one, one more thing that we might be able to do as policymakers is um, subsidize, right? So if we take the existing assumptions of these materials costs, and if you're familiar in this industry, you know that these cost assumptions are very aggressive and very generous for sodium ion. Basically, the difference between the red curve and the black curve represents, uh, until the point they intersect, represents the amount a government could, for example, subsidize uh, to ensure that the, uh, the technology adoption can, can happen, um, assuming that the performance, obviously, is on par, right? So in this case, 26 billion is not that much. But something to keep in mind, though, is that given that the curve shapes look so similar, this is highly sensitive to the dollar per kilogram assumption. And so just a slight increase in dollar per kilogram could end up with a number way bigger than that. Right. Now, if we come back and revisit our original assumptions um, in, in the spirit of this holistic systems analysis, um, we can again see that this is actually not entirely correct. Because in actuality, it looks more like this. And that's because of certain inherent material properties inside uh, sodium ion that hurt their volumetric energy density. Now, you may say volumetric energy density doesn't matter for grid scale storage, maybe. But it is true that to contain one kilowatt hour of energy, you need one 290 amp hour-ish prismatic cell for LFP, whereas you would need two for sodium ion. And to have a 100 megawatt hour installation for a grid scale deployment, you would need 50 of these 40 foot containers for LFP, but you need 100 for sodium ion. So what's, what's important to recognize is that even a cell level cost parity condition is still not sufficient for sodium ion to take over. Now, what does this mean for sodium ion and, and specifically short duration storage? Um, I think it's kind of clear that sodium ions will not, will not be this ultra low cost savior to our lithium woes, um, but potentially the cost of not doing sodium ion may be actually greater um, just because of the impending demand shortfall that we will have. And what's interesting about this kind of an anal analysis is that uh, we can, based on the sensitivity analysis, recommend key research directions that maximize the bang for the buck, right? And so I won't go through, in these, go through these in detail, but some of these uh, recommendations that we have are that the anode is something that can break, make or break the technology and that we really need more attention here. The cathodes need to keep up at a given rate just to be competitive with lithium ion. And maybe the best way to maintain low costs for short duration storage is to increase lithium extraction. But my point here today is really not to convince you whether you should invest in sodium ion or not, or whether you should bet, bet big on it, um, but to really illustrate the power of this kind of techno-economic framework and this kind of system, systems level thinking, and apply it to the longer duration storage technologies that we really uh, want to be talking about today, um, because this is really a good chemistry agnostic toolkit for evaluating those technologies. So by combining this holistic technical scope with this learning techno-economic framework, it helps us really better decide, as engineers and scientists in, the, in this room, what should we actually work on to improve our chances of success. Uh, for the energy, uh, for the, I guess, the C-suite executives and policymakers in the room, where should we invest our resources? And for all of us, where should we dedicate our time to make sure that what we're working on is actually uh, has the maximum chance of uh, high impact. So with that, uh, I'd like to end here and uh, take any questions in the panel and chat afterwards. Thank you. Uh, Adrian, thank you. Uh, Clyde and Aaron, if I can ask you to join us, please. All right. Well, thank you for the comprehensive presentations to start the day along with Steve. Now we have about uh, 35 minutes to talk about linking your three presentations together. So let me get started here with just a couple of questions to do so, and then we'll open up the, uh, to questions from everyone here in the room. So Aaron, I thought I might start with your talk. Um, 
so you discuss a number of metrics, um, efficiency, uh, cost per kilowatt hour, cost per kilowatt. And there's been one metric that's on my mind, which is energy throughput per year. So for a particular technology, particular installation, how many kilowatt hour will the battery discharge per investment per site per year? And specifically, I'm really curious, as to go to the very long duration storage, if you were to consider how often that resource will be deployed to generate revenue uh, for the owner, what would that look like and how would it compare to the short duration storage? Yeah, that's a great question. I um, I don't have um, the specific details on, on that. I didn't look at that but um, in, within the, the study results. But what I can say is that I think for all the technologies is that most of them were not um, discharged at rated power um, for most of the time. So a lot of them um, were running, could um, had a duration, were operating at a duration of, of two to four times what they're rated because they were um, outputting at a lower power limit, and so, or they were just used less. And so, you know, part of it is, is you need that resource adequacy, and so you have assets on, that need to be there to uh, ensure the grid is reliable, but they're not necessarily dispatched all the time. And so I think, you know, as you get into those higher renewable penetrations, you'll see, um, you'll see more of that, but, um, you know, and when you have that flexibility um, in, in sort of the reference case and you have gas and, and other assets um, that can provide that flexibility, then you, storage is, um, the way it's selected is probably more optimally used. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe just build on a little bit more and also inviting uh, Clyde and Adrian to, to, chip, uh, to chime in as well. Um, is there a scenario where because of the tail of the distribution of storage duration required, say for example, the 100 plus hour you are mentioning, um, is there a scenario in which they will not be running all the time and therefore leading to a lower return on investment? And if so, how does one construct the market, the policy, and the technology so then the return on investment is better over time? Yeah, and I, and I think it goes back to um, you know, how, how, we, how climate change and it evolves over time, especially in those renewable penetration, high renewable penetration or like 100% renewable, um, it, it really is gonna look at like how, what do those future weather years look like? And that's gonna, I think, play into the answer quite a bit. And so th there's a lot of efforts in gathering data um, to un inform those weather models as well to inform going forward. Clyde, what is the LSO perspective on this? Well, th that's very difficult. <laughs> so I agree with Aaron. If you look at my, my, my plots, it's back in 2019, we saw a week with very little um, wind and solar, right? How often is that going to happen is a big question. Um, but I think, you know, like today, how we operate uh, nu the nuclear plants and the other renewables like geothermal and biomass, that could be um, a place where we can operate uh, long-term or long-duration storage, kind of pretty close to base loaded, right? I do not want to say base loaded because what the system needs today is flexibility, right? Because you, on one side you have variable supply, and on the load side is uh, unpredictable demand, right? So, so the system is varying. Um, so whatever it is we decide to do, uh, we got to hinge back on the operational needs. Right, so a lot of times it may not be the most cost effective, but reliability is gonna trump whatever it is that we develop, right? So in other words, can a battery provide the three things we talked about? Frequency control, voltage control, and can it move, can it provide flexibility? Because one last point, uh, in California today, in 10 minutes with the amount of uh, renewables, and we didn't even hit on the rooftop PV, it impacts system frequency just as great. The system is changing plus or minus, not every hour, but in some hours, plus or minus 1,000 to plus or minus 2,000 megawatts in 10 minutes, right? That's hard to predict. It's hard to control. And can storage fill that gap? How do we, you know, so it's not just storage. It's how do we predict that variability? And it's a natural variability. So I tell folks, you can, you can forecast uh, what the renewable is going to do on an average, let's say, next 10 minutes 
or the next hour. But I get benchmark as to how well I control every four seconds. And I have to report to note every minute, did I do a good job, did I do a bad job, right? So uh, whatever it is we design in terms of storage, it has to be able to give the system operator the flexibility, you know, to, to, to operate the grid. Yeah, and add to that is, is the, um, spe specifically for the, the storage, the technologies that have longer duration that might not be cycled as much. I think uh, uh, two, there are two components that we really need to think about from, from the, I guess, the economic side of things, right? There's the, how are they going to pay back the, um, their return on investment? Um, and that might be dictated by the market, and uh, it really depends on where you are to dictate what that cost tolerance should be. I'm not going to pretend like I can answer that question, but something that was really interesting from this kind of analysis that I presented earlier is that the rate of market growth will significantly affect uh, what that cost fall would be, and if we're only implementing and, and building and commissioning these plants out of a sake of more so insurance as opposed to daily cycling needs, then there is a consideration there of how quickly then will the technology costs fall. Uh, and might need to start off with something that is very already inherently low, that doesn't rely on rapid learning rates to, we can't bank on learning rates in that case. So to add to that, um, like you said, if, if they're only there for assurance and you have the opportunity to have other like natural gas resources, is it gonna get selected? There's not as much demand. So again, it really goes back to the different scenarios and do you have other alternatives um, you know, instead of, of that you know, seasonal or you know, weekly storage? Yeah. Well, this is a great opportunity for Stanford since the new Door School of Sustainability will have a significant focus on predicting climate change. So stay tuned. Um, maybe this is a good segue to the technology aspect. Um, so, so Adrian, you talked quite a bit about the learning rate, and you hinted at also some performance trade-off as well. Um, similar, Aaron, you also talk about the competing requirement of round-trip efficiency and cost. And these are complex trade-offs. So Adrian, I'm wondering if you can comment a little bit on whether there are technologies on the horizon that there is an interesting trade-off between performance and learning rate. So can you give up some on performance but have dramatically accelerated learning rates mm -hmm. as a way to get things out to the market, out to the grid sooner? Yeah, I think, I think some of the challenges with specifically long duration energy storage and energy prices in general is that it's a commoditized area. And you're starting with new technology, which may not hit all performance metrics or maybe outperforming existing technologies, but cost more. Um, and whereas lithium ion could enter the market with, uh, at least in the electric, uh, electric vehicle space with luxury EVs like Tesla's, uh, or really starting from camcorders that had the tolerance to um, have this cost performance trade off. Here you're really trying to sell something that potentially is more expensive and less performing at the outset. Um, but there may be other markets that, and this may be require the support of governments um, or other policymakers, is to subsidize the implementation of these technologies in ulterior markets that can affect the market growth rate. So for sodium ion, for example, uh, one example would be like two-wheelers or three-wheelers in, in a place like uh, auto rickshaws in India. Um, areas that can really allow sodium ion to at least get a foothold, get a bite, and begin to accelerate their learning rate and deployment. Um, but the challenge is really this, you're operating at the opposite end of the spectrum where you're trying to inject new technology uh, that might perform worse and might cost more than what really needs to be a commodity. Aaron, how about in your analysis, I know you created these hypothetical batteries. Um, you looked at round trip efficiency and cost. Did you look at all four combinations of them? Um, yes, yeah, we looked at different scenarios. Um, th there's other performance factors um, that go into their um, you know, self-discharge when you look at really long, long duration storage, self-discharge becomes a factor in how it gets used. Um, and um, the ability, you know, flexibility is a big thing, like can you ramp quickly and, and just, so um, yes, we did look at some, um, unfortunately I can't share 
I don't have off the top of my head like how all of those intersected, um, but it is something that is has looked at. Are there strong sensitivity to some of these trade-offs? Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting. Um, s some move things more than others, um, and you know, we we did model. Um, a regular flow battery as well, um, sort of at, at its current state and, and where we think it might project and, um, you know, just didn't get selected. We, we tried a, a bunch of different scenarios and it just didn't get selected and, and so we really need to, uh, it, you know, part of it was probably, uh, may have been our assumptions on what is really the optimistic scenario of that. Um, and it takes into account not just the technology, but as Adrian said, like what's the total installed cost? What's the total operating cost? Um, and there's, you know, trade-offs in, in um, you know, lithium ion and the degradation, that's another factor. So, you know, with lithium ion, how we did overbuild and account for augmentation in that cost, so, um, and other technologies not. So, um, a lot of assumptions, and so I think that's another um, technology factor that, uh, that is, plays into it, is what is the um, operating cost mm -hmm. as well. There are many unknowns and many big unknowns as well. No, that's definitely the, uh, the central challenge here. So maybe just one final question before we open up uh, to the floor for discussion. So Clyde, um, in, in thinking about policy and market drivers for techno technology demonstration and deployment, um, uh, just uh, last year we had a great panel discussion here. I can't remember, I think you might have also been on that panel as well with representatives from pg and &E. And we were talking about how power purchase agreement for energy storage can be a really big driver. Uh, I think pg &E went as far as saying, well, you know, give me something reasonable, we will have the PPA in place to get the technology deployed. How is that looking at? How powerful is that as a knob and a driver? And what more can we do there? So a lot of folks look at economics, right? Unfortunately, I look at reliability. So you can design any market, and you can put any kind of objective functions to minimize costs, right? And you, most markets in the US, they operate on a five minute basis. So if you can forecast what that demand is in five minutes, you can always find the cheapest energy to serve that. When it comes to passing that commitment to the system operator, he is faced with things like controllability, frequency control, regulation, contingency reserve, Right, the ability to ramp, right, and the ability to report back to the guys in the east that I do a good job controlling the grid. It's not just balancing, it's but balancing. The US has the strictest control performance standard in the whole world, right? We got, we got frequency limits that we got to operate to, and if you do not have the flexibility and you exceed one of those limits, either high or low, right, for, for more than 30 minutes, that's just one standard you get hit with a million dollars in fine. We have another one where if, if you lose an element and I cannot bring my system back in 15 minutes, that's another million bucks in fine, right? We got another one that, that this is spread out across a year. If something happens like, let, let's say the West, from Colorado all the way out to um, uh, California, if we lose, anybody loses something, I got 52 seconds to help, right? 53 seconds, it's too late, right? So if I do a good job in 52 seconds at the end of the, the year, let's say we look at 20 events, the median is what I get benchmark on. That again comes with fines, right? Uh, when you regulate the grid, high frequency, high ACE, you know, it, in other parts of the world, if you have high ACE or high frequency, that's fine. They allow the frequency to deviate. You cannot do that in the US. In the US, if you have, uh, problems, you gotta contain that within your system. And if I do not have the flexibility to maintain that, it's very, very difficult. As I said, you know, plus or minus 1,000 to 2,000 megawatts variability in 10 minutes is not easy. I need something, we need to change markets one way, right? I need to have something that would tell, or, or automatically determine what's that uh, uh, frequency change, right? Because when, the way market works today, Right, is you make a decision probably seven and a half minutes before you're binding five minutes. And you instruct units to move for that anticipated load. Well, let's say wind kicks up a thousand megawatts and solar kicks up another 500 megawatts. 
There is no mechanism today to tell those units, hey, I do not want you to go, let's say from 100 to 150, I need you to stay where you are or decrease production. These are the kind of uh, input we need to feed back to the market designers, to, to guys like you, right? If you know the, the challenges we face in the industry, then you could design something that could help me control that, right? So most of my talk is gonna be reliability, what it is I need to comply with, and hopefully you could design, when you design, you gotta fit in that model, not just cost and not just return efficiency, but can I vary my production, you know, as I was saying, electric vehicles. We're gonna have so many in California. Why can't we just use some of those to control frequency? And control that in a way where it's transparent to um, an electric vehicle owner. So it's gonna be something like, you buy an electric vehicle, and you would provide frequency control whenever that's plugged in, and that's tr totally transparent to you. How nice would it be at the end of the month, you get a check from PG&E or, or your electric provider for 100 bucks or 200 bucks, say, say <coughs> you provide a frequency control, and you didn't even do anything, hmm. right? So things like that, we gotta start thinking. Uh, electric vehicles, I think eventually they're gonna come up with batteries that can do almost everything, right? But, but you gotta know what it is we need so you could design it, um, you know, to, to, to help. I can see the title of um, a, a publicational book that says, Long Duration Energy Storage, colon, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully through the efforts of folks in this room, uh, we will make it less complicated and hopefully converging on a number of key solutions. So we have some time to address questions from the audience. Uh, it's really a privilege to have this distinguished panel here. So, there, please. Then there. So my question on the techno-economic analysis, have you factored in what a carbon price does to those various models and what carbon prices would really drive more progress? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, no, <laughs> the answer is no but it certainly would be a next step. Um, but coming back to the policy side of things, that would be in, in the same vein and flavor is kind of like the subsidy analysis, uh, understanding what government intervention or what kind of subsidies would help uh, with adoption. And for example, if you compare, that, compare the numbers that we, I, I showed earlier with the, what the IRA has had for um, cell manufacturing, for example, the $35 per kilowatt hour um, credit, those do fall within the range of what, what could be done and the gap that we are seeing. So um, the answer is no, not yet on the carbon uh, pricing, but certainly something we, sh we should look into. Erin, maybe you can comment from the EPRI side. Yeah, apologies. Um, I'm not the modeler. I'm you know, providing the storage input, so I can't speak directly to how that was modeled, but if you want, we can follow up offline. I can connect you to see how we take that in and how it's accounted for in the different policy scenarios. Um, Clyde, I think it's fantastic the way you framed it, you know, reliability versus economics. And so one of the things I've always wondered is uh, what is the value of that reliability? Is there a price point? I mean, if you are buying car insurance, right, if there's a miscalculation, you're going to cook again adjustment in your premium. Um, so how should, and this is open to the panel, how should we be thinking about the, the value of that reliability and how would we structure a market to enable that? That, that's a very tough question, right? Um, I, th I think when it comes down to reliability, well, let me step back. When I was a young kid, I grew up in the Caribbean. And back then, you know those big TVs? We had a 23-inch TV, and when the voltage was low, it was 19 inches. <laughs> and, and we were happy, because we had a black and white TV. Today, uh, when it comes to reliability, you know, young kids, uh, you know, just uh, when my kid was, she was six, and we had um, lost electricity. I was working for PG&E at the time, and she called me up and she goes, Dad, I want to see Rugrats. Can you turn the electricity back on? Right? So the kids today, they want electricity almost all the time. Right? And it, it, it's, how do we re maintain that? Right? You know, we have like a one day in 10, 10 years where it's acceptable from a planning perspective. But when it comes down to um, real time, 
it, it's very, very difficult, you know. Um, and, and I look at the system, you know, as I said, every minute. And if, let's say, we short in generation, you could lean on the rest of the interconnection. But for how long do you want to lean? When I say lean, if, if I do not have enough generation, I can lean on somebody else, right? But you cannot do that constantly, right, for, for the same period every, every, every day, you know? So we, when we started looking at this with a lot of solar, when solar dropped off on evenings, we saw the efficiency on the system, right? I went back to, to, to NERC and I said, you know, we have a problem out west. Uh, because when the solar drops off, it's, it's very, very difficult to make up that energy. And back then, you know, we were forecasting 13,000 megawatts uh, to make up on evenings. Today, it's 20,000. But we figured out how to solve that, right? The, the, the challenge we see now is like during sunrise. But to go back to your original question, I think it depends. And if, um, like for me, I want to see, I want electricity 24-7, 365. I know we're going to have hiccups, right? But true natural disasters, that's something we can, we can live with. But on a normal, uh, one, one last point, on a normal steady state operating condition with everything in service, that's my biggest challenge today, right? And when I say biggest challenge, we have, we have standards. So if you lose an element, you have standards that kick in. If you lose two elements, we have other standards that kick in, and you know exactly what to do. But on a normal steady state condition, that variability, we can't predict that. And you cannot control it. That's why we need help. So I tell folks under N minus zero, on a normal steady state condition, is the predicting that variability, controlling to that variability is, is really, really difficult. Right? And, and again, for me, um, I want to see uh, as close to 100% reliability. Uh, as we, we could provide. Um, I'd like, when I was Secretary of Energy, I thought if we relaxed the frequency and voltage controls, we would have a more reliable system. It would be a lot cheaper. Uh, your standards are very different. Um, the people who really care about tight control have their own systems, if you're a chip manufacturer. Is there any possibility that we can relax these controls? As you go in the future, we will actually need them relaxed even more. Um, but mm. can we do this? So, Professor Chu, you hit the nail right on his head. Right? I think we have two strict of control standards. Right? So the, the one I talked about where we need, we, or we get benchmark every minute as to how well we support the interconnection frequency. I've been asking the guys back east, can we relax that to uh, uh, five minutes or even 10 minutes, right? Can we allow frequency to move a little, little, little higher than, today we have 36 millihertz. You gotta operate within that. Well, the system ain't gonna collapse if I go to 37 mm -hmm. or even go below that. Uh, so uh, these are the kind of stuff that uh, we need to get um, academia, we need to get um, NERC to understand. But I've been saying this is the exact thing. Up to last week, I was in a meeting in Tucson, and I was complaining about why do I need to control to every minute when we have variability on the system? I cannot predict that load. We have today we got 12,000 megawatts of rooftop PV. I have no visibility, no controllability, right? It impacts system frequency. So I agree with you 110 percent. We need to think about relaxing some of these strict control performance standards we have within the U.S. The problem it was that I couldn't figure out where the points of resistance were actually coming from. Because until you know who's pushing back, uh, you can't really change it. Um, do you have any clue? Because it, it, uh, it's, you know, I mean, everything is all about money in the end. And so you have to follow the money. And so who's going to lose money if you relax the frequency and voltage control? Uh, well, I don't think anybody's going to lose money if we relax voltage and frequency control. I think, I think the standards need to change, right? And the standard, remember, we operate in with standards that were developed for controllable supply and predictable demand. We operate with these same control performance standards today when you have variable supply and unpredictable demand. So we need to change that, right? And, and the people that could change that is the North American Electric Reliability Council. We can just say well, what it is we need. 
Even within my company, when I said, hey, we need to relax some of these standards, I get resistance, you know, why do we want to relax it? You know, and again, you know, my response is, if the system is not gonna collapse, why do I need to control, you know, that tight? You know, it's, it comes back to um, electricity. It travels at the speed of light, right? We control it every four seconds, right? And we, I think we do a pretty good job control that every uh, four seconds, but four seconds is pretty slow. And, and, and I like to go back and hit on something, I think I brought this up the last time, when, when you explain that to a high school student, controlling the grid every four seconds, they go, well, what's your problem, right? <laughs> well, well, my response is, you try driving down the freeway at 60 miles an hour with your eyes closed, and every four seconds you open your eyes to see where you're going. <laughs> Well, well, you might be able to do that, but today with the variable supply, that, that road is not straight anymore. It's very windy. So trying to control every four seconds now is, is more and more difficult, right? And again, one takeaway, and you can quote me, is the system is not gonna collapse We're under N minus zero, which is everything in, under normal, steady state operating condition. It ain't gonna collapse, and again, why do we need these six strict uh, standards? That's actually a really interesting point. If, if, if we did actually reduce those constraints, you could promote more adoption of CNI type batteries for the, the chip fabs that actually do need that frequency control and then they would promote that market growth rate. Mm -hmm. well, well, you know, even within the US, if you look at OCA, they allow the frequency to go down to 59.3 before they start dropping a lot. In the West, 59.5, we start, you know, automatically uh, tripping load. So if it can work there, why can't it work in the rest of the country? So we've been modeling for years showing that we're gonna need a lot of long duration storage and yet almost none has been deployed. And because it's not been deployed, we're not getting any sort of learning curves. And it, it appears that the reason it's not getting deployed is because none of the actors in the market see any value in deploying it, right? So someone alluded to the fact that recently a bunch of CCAs went out for a long duration uh, procurement, but they, what they meant by that was eight hours, not multi-day. And so I guess the question is what has to change about the way we evaluate RA or uh, compensate people for doing this that would actually cause the utilities and the other people who are actually gonna be deploying this stuff to start doing so. Uh, that's a tough one, and please don't not quote me. <laughs> the, way, the way things work is you have to have a blackout for folks to realize you have a problem, right? So, so today, the, the way the things work, and the way the operators control the grid, uh, nobody sees a problem, right? I remember going into my office one, one weekend, and I told my boss we had a lot of problems over the weekend. And he asked me two things. He goes, did we drop a load? And I go, no. He said, did we go into a stage emergency? And I go, no. And he said, well, what was your problem? Right? So the general public, they, once they have electricity, they think everything is fine. But we couldn't control the grid for 11 hours. Right? And that was a challenge for the operators. But we didn't go into a, a, a blackout. But these are the kind of things I think the general public needs to understand that and I guess most of you understand, like today, we have to control the grid every four seconds. We've got to report to NERC every minute as to how well can we uh, control. But a lot of you didn't realize that that's something you have to do. Then there's another thing that we do. If we operate at high frequency, you speed time up, and vice versa, at low frequency, you slow time down. We operate to a clock, in, an automatic clock in, um, in Colorado. And as soon as you hit five seconds, either too much or too less, you gotta correct that, right? So there are a lot, a lot of hidden things that system operator has to do in the background. This is why flexibility is really, really important. So whatever it is we design again, has to take in mind, can, they, can whatever it is I come up with, can that help the system operator control the grid? And again, uh, Professor Chu, if you could help in relaxing some of these standards, I've been trying. I think that would go a long way. So you just need to know who to call. So. <laughs> I would add, you know, we looked at um, 
how energy storage is being modeled in integrated resource planning. And um, you know, if you look at, at, at different utilities and how they're modeling it, um, you know, some, some technologies are being, uh, energy storage technologies are being included, but not the wide landscape of technologies that are under development. And there's, and there's um, challenges with like confidence levels and the, and the cost and the technology. So whatever we can do to keep advancing and demonstrating and um, really understanding um, the energy storage cost and performance characteristics, then we can get them in resource planning models because right now you're seeing you know, lithium ion, maybe flow, pumped hydro, but you're not seeing the wide variety necessarily in many of the resource plans um, that, that the market is, it, that are being brought to the market. I think as a question for Glider, uh, very simple question. As operator, do you treat this large scale energy storage system as an engine market or as an ancillary service market components? It's both. Suppose. Yeah, because you need you need well energy, and and uh, capacity used to be a problem. When I say capacity, uh, we the industry used to plan to meet that peak, let's say for the day or peak for the month. What we're finding out now is you could meet that peak, but you may not be able to meet the energy needs, get into that peak. So your problem might be ten in the morning, eleven, where you have a hard time balancing supply and demand, but I could meet that peak. So what NERC's doing right now, they're coming up uh, revising two standards. I happen to be on, on both. And we're looking at energy needs as opposed to just capacity needs, right? Do I have the flexibility in the fleet to meet that variability? Uh, so that comes with both energy and then ancillary services, right? So we have a lot of batteries today. They, they move every four seconds and they help, which is great. But you also need you know, the energy component. You mentioned quite, you mentioned quite, just a meal. You mentioned quite a few times, four, seven. Is that the scale of flush, right? Uh, no, that's not the scale. That, that, that's a requirement. So in North America, it, the standard is really every six seconds. We do it every four seconds. We have other entities. I think ERCOT does it every two seconds. You've got to balance your supply and demand. Right? One of the things we're thinking of doing, and you'd see this pretty soon, uh, we want to implement um, frequency control on inverter based resources a lot quicker today because of the variability we're seeing. Right? So if you see, and, and I think we're going to do this towards the end of the year, today we do not do anything within, let's say, 36 millihertz. Right? The pushers are cut that in half. And you start helping control the grid from roughly 17 millihertz, you're going to start uh, doing something. Well, we already started to get pushback to implement this because, you know, in the old days, you tried to do it. Um, uh, conventional units said warranty on the units. You're going to have to move a lot more to do it. Today, you have inverter based resources, everything is software driven. Why can't they do it? Right? But the pushback is, why should I do it when they didn't do it? Right? So, so it's, a, it's, it's a lot of back and forth, but it's something I think we need to do because, as I said, plus or minus 1,000 to 2,000 megawatts in 10 minutes, if we can cut that down 50, 60 percent by doing something or inverter based resources helping, that would go a long way. You mentioned the no, no, that's a new standard that's called uh, frequency response that the federal government imposed. There was a reason for that. In other parts of the world, um, they do not allow a unit to operate at Pmax. So if you build a, a 100 megawatt unit, you got to operate in stuff like, in, like I know in, in um, um, Europe, it's 97.5%. You got to reserve headroom to automatically provide that frequency response, right? In Latin America, they reserve 8%. In the US, we reserve 0%, right? Uh, I brought that up, that what they were doing, in order to get that frequency response in, in you know, within 52 seconds, why don't we allow or, or impose on units they need to maintain headroom? Well, I almost got beat for saying that. Because if I build a 100 megawatt unit, 
Why do you want me to hold back 5% or 3% or whatever, right? They build that unit to maximize, um, you know, um, economics, right, to maximize profit. So a lot of things has to change, uh, and that's a simple thing. Like today when we uh, curtail wind and solar, they need to automatically provide frequency control, frequency response um, up. If something goes bad, they need to provide that um, um, uh, ancillary service, right? What happens is if you have, let's say, an inverter base, like a wind farm, and you've got 10 inverter banks, and we could tell you what they do is they could tell, they take the inverters offline, right? So if it's a 100 megawatt plant, let's say you have 10 inverters, 10 megawatts a piece, and let's say we could tell you 50%, they take off five inverters. So when you think you have 50 megawatts of headroom, you may have zero. So we gotta get some of these rules changed where when we say we could tell you, thou must provide these kind of, um, controls, right? So, so we're working on things like that. Uh, it's a requirement from FERC that says you must be, no, that says you need to have the capability to provide frequency control. They did not say you need, you must provide it. So having the capability and maintaining that headroom is two different things, right? So um, it, it's a good start by having the capability, but um, we need some more, um, um, brute force, you know, implemented in there that says you need to be able to provide that. Because that's the first line of defense any system has, right? And the Europeans, they were smart. They said, we're not going to allow you to operate a PMAX. Provide that across the board for free, right? Uh, same thing in, in Latin America. Why can't we do it? Well, on that note, uh, Indri, Clyde, and Aaron, thank you very much for sharing your insights. I want to thank you, Clyde, in particular. Now I think I have uh, my next bumper sticker ready, make the duck fly. <laughs> thank you very much. Aaron, thank you.